Okay, everyone. Um, this was just, uh, it's re really exciting to be here today. Let me just put on my notes here on the side. So for the ones that know, uh, have seen Kubrick's uh, masterpiece, uh, know he wasn't just, uh, just a movie director, he was also like a visionary, right? He was the one that first sort of combining artificial intelligence into a fully automated service that was capable of forecasting a failure with hours in advance. So there is, uh, there is uh, Al's several, uh, uh, so uh, there is a quotation from Al saying, the system is going to fail in 72 hours. That was amazing from that. And I must say it is really exciting times now, and being here today is a result of hours of investigation and you will, you are the lucky ones because you will, and please guys, come, come up front, like, please don't stay up there because this is really exciting now. I'll try to compress everything like under 20 minutes, just for you guys. Machine learning for SRE. First, who am I? My name is Ricardo Amaro. I work based in Lisbon for Acquia, which is a fast growing company, everybody knows. Uh, on the site reliability engineering team. I adopted Linux since the 90s. Uh, I'm passionate about software freedom and privacy rights. And I've been in the Drupal community for over nine years, I think. Uh, mainly contributed to infrastructure, the CI teams, etc. A quick flashback. So in, in 2012, I submitted a, a DevOps session uh, about multi-region, I was really surprised it got selected. I submitted another talk in 2013 about something no one knew at that time, Docker. Who knows Docker today? Good. In, for, in 2014, I worked with Jeremy Torson um, on the proof of concept to remake the Drupal test bots. I think everybody used that, those today. So it was a good initiative. It is good to be investigating stuff. In 2015, I presented last year in, in Dublin, Site Reliability Engineering. That was a cool session. So this year, I thought maybe we can automate more. So maybe we can put machine learning together with Site Reliability Engineering. So the, today I'm compressing that in two min, 20 minutes. And Acquia, here are some numbers. Uh, we have above uh, 19,600 uh, instances. That's a lot of things to manage. We need a lot of automation for that. We have uh, more than 55,000 sites in production. Uh, we do trans data transfer above 14 petabytes per month. Okay, that's enough. And this, year, this is the agenda for today. So, Recall, what is SRE? Well, we'll go just really, really quick. Machine learning, then neural networks, then having some talk about the libraries, and then uh, some SRE problems that machine learning can actually solve, and then have a lightning demo, and then talk about the GPU and TensorBoard, and then some conclusions. So please raise your hand if you know SRE. Okay, okay. So. Last year's presentation is available on video, and also my friend and colleague, uh, Amin Asani is writing on the front, is giving a, an SRE crash course at 2.15. Be sure to be there. Don't miss it. Uh, a quen from, from Ben Trainer, uh, so he's the VP of um, Operations 24-7 at Google. He says, reliability is the most fundamental feature of any product. A system isn't very useful if nobody can use it, right? So because reliability is so critical, SRE is focused on finding ways to improve the design and operation of systems to make them more scalable, reliable, efficient. Automation and forecasting are for sure a response to that. 
SREs are engineers that apply the principles of computer science and engineering to design and develop computing systems. Sometimes their task is writing software. Sometimes their task is just building all the additional pieces those systems need. So next, what is machine learning? Anyone here is a data, science, data scientist? No one is a data scientist here? No, okay. So has anyone already built a recommendation engine or like a classifier, image classifier, video classifier, used it? Okay, it's getting better. Okay, so, so and uh, has anyone used that narrow network? Cool, great. So every time you, s you use Google search, every time Facebook recognizes your, f your friend's face, every time your computer marks an email as spam, it's always machine learning. Machine learning is a field of computer science that uses statistical methods to create algorithms and then learn to improve the performance over time. So most machine learning algorithms, they can be divided in two categories. Some that we supervise what they will learn and some that we just feed them data and they will learn by themselves. And what do we mean by learning? So there, there is an academic explanation there. I'm not going into that deep. But all of the slides here and all of the code will be available later, and I have a GitHub uh, repo for this. But artificial intelligence is not only machine learning. So historically, we have had search agents to solving problems. These tend to be slower, you know? Like, they are uh, complex, they take a lot of memory. So this, is, this also includes the Minimax uh, algorithm here, it's, it's made to solve the tic-tac-toe puzzle. And you also have like BSD or, or A-star or genetic algorithms. So all of those are, are classic uh, ways of using artificial intelligence. And they can be consulted in the book, that book that was there. Um, so games, I would like to uh, quickly tell you the story about these two human-machine matches. The first happened in 1997, in which Garry Kasparov, a human, lost a chess game against Deep Blue. But maybe today, nobody really cares about that because it's, it's already in the past. But at that time, that was really, really a challenge, right? So IBM did that. And 20 years after, the ancient Chinese game of Go, which is much more complex in terms of ramifications than chess, was actually solved and won by the DeepMind from Google using a program called the AlphaGo. But the first game was not this one. So how old is this? In 1959, a pioneer called Arthur Samuel, using the alphabet of pruning, was able to teach a machine to won, won the, the check, checkers game to himself. So, so the machine won him. So he was able to teach a machine to be better than him. But over the past years, AI, in contrast with the past where AI was put in trash, technology trash, or either the future of humanity solving problems. The last years, AI has exploded. So mostly due to GPU. The processing of a GPU is much better than the CPU for math, and it's faster and it's cheaper. And the flood of data of every, of every stripe, like images, texts, transactions, logs, you name it. So why now? In the SRE world, deployments are getting faster, right? We need to deploy faster and faster, 
features must be out there the next day. And we humans can only react that fast, right? So we need to automate more and get decisions right. You, we need to be smarter on monitoring. And also because we can. We have enough data. We have cheap graphical processing units. And we can use those algorithms. So what are neural networks? A neural network is composed of artificial neurons. An artificial neuron is a mathematical function conceived as a model as the same as comparable to the biological neuron in our brains. So it receives one thing, one or more inputs, and sums them, and then produces an output. The transfer functions usually is a sigmoid, but can be any other function. How can we apply this? So there is a checklist you can consult in the slides late, later. So you first check if any of the traditional methods I, I talked about and the, the ones that you can consult can solve the problem. If they can't, then you find whatever neural network is able to solve your problem. And then you choose a library from the ones that we're going to talk about. Then you format the data, you augment the data, and you feed batches of data into the neural network until it's trained. And you can actually save that model so you don't need to train every time. So what kind of data can we use? We can you use machine data. We can use traffic data. We'll have an example of it, about that. We can have agent data synthetic data, and human sentiment data. So imagine what Google and Facebook are doing right now with your data that's on Facebook or Google. So machine learning library's popularity has, changed, has been changing over time. Over the course of this investigation, I've been working with all of these, but today I'm just focusing on the, the ones above, Keras and TensorFlow. Google's TensorFlow is nothing but NumPy in Python with a huge twist. So the major difference is that TensorFlow first builds a graph of that operation there, and then you can just start the session and run it. So it's built to be scalable. So you can scale it for several machines to use several GPUs. So it feeds a lot of data in very slow, very slow time. And Keras, it's to simplify TensorFlow uh, coding. So some issues that machine learning can help to solve on uh, SRE. We, have, we need noise reduction in terms of alerts. We need to detect anomalies and increase reliability. We need to automate workflows and around situations. We need ticket categorization. Imagine a ticket comes to support. You don't have to have like someone just oh, yeah, this ticket is this category and goes like with this label. No, you can just train a machine to do that for you. It's trainable. And service levels forecast for capacity planning. You can also detect recurring situations to avoid them. And of course, have less alerts for humans and more uh, time for good stuff. So to give some examples very quick, I, I've prepared here. I recorded the demos so we don't have to lose time with them. Sound, please. Sound, please. Is it? Why is it? Uh, Is it playing? Sound, please. Hello? It should be giving sound. It has uh, uh, low CPU, RAM is OK. Yeah, thank you. Uh, low storage, this I'll has high CPU, this is high RAM. So we should see this healthy. This is this mic chill. The first demo here is to use a SkyDeep Learn library to uh, train a decision tree uh, in order to check if the server health is OK or not. Uh, for that, we're going to use a, an initial uh, set of data to train uh, our decision tree, and then uh, which, which uses uh, CPU, RAM, and storage uh, 
over the last six hours, the average. First, we import, then we actually bring in our data, and then the first, the first thing we do is actually create the MyTree uh, with the decision tree classifier object, and then we train that tree with the metrics and the states. So this is server that has uh, uh, low CPU, RAM is okay, uh, low storage, this has high CPU, this is high RAM, so we should see this healthy, this is not healthy, and this is not healthy. Correct, so healthy, unhealthy, unhealthy. This is not using neural networks, this is just using a decision tree, but it's, it's also machine learning. We can visualize that uh, in a tree. Uh, the decision tree that checks if the storage is below or equal to 85% over the last six hours, yes. If all is yes, then we're okay, so the, the server is healthy. If any of these checks just uh, is, is false, then we get the server is unhealthy. This is done by just training data, it, and it's not a huge set of that. So in my next demo, we are going to code a neural network from scratch just using NumPy. We're not going to use any specific machine learning library. Uh, we're just going to import NumPy and then we're going to create a segment. This is the activation of a neuron, uh, a function that will map any value uh, to the value uh, between zero and one. Uh, so we use it to convert numbers to probabilities. The basis uh, of a neural network is a perceptron classifier, uh, a simple model of a neuron. It has different inputs. The weighted sums of these inputs is then passed through a step function, uh, which is a sigmoid in our case. And then this is an example of a neural network. Here, uh, we start uh, by initializing the data set as a matrix with input data. Each row is a different training example. Uh, each column represents a different neuron. Our output data with one output neuron each is defined. We seed them to make them more deterministic, so we give random numbers with the same starting point, so we can get the same sequence of generated numbers every time we run the program. We create synapse uh, matrices, so we initialize the weights of a neural uh, network. Uh, it is a neural network with two layers of weights. So in this case, uh, we have uh, three input neurons, four hidden neurons, and uh, one output neuron. Uh, the value of every link are stored uh, in synapse zero and synapse one. Uh, the following code trains the neural network. Uh, so it passes every data, it evaluates the error, and it updates the weights using back propagation. So let's test this. So we can see that the error rate uh, decreases after each iteration, uh, and that after training it for exactly 100,000 times, the results get closer and closer to the expected objective. So our objective was uh, 10710, and we got uh, 0 0.999, uh, 0 0.69, 0 0.99, and 000 which is pretty good for, for our first neural network. So we've trained the neural network with success. So now I'm going to give uh, an introduction to TensorFlow. Uh, thank you, Aaron uh, Schumacher, for uh, sharing this. OK, so names in execution in uh, Python and TensorFlow. A name in Python is separated from an object. Uh, the name points at the object and not the way around. We can see this by just going over this example here. So we have a list, uh, we, we put the list into foe, and then we say, okay, foe now goes into var, and then uh, we try to compare uh, foe to var. It looks they are the same. So is foo var? Yes. So the ID of foo it equals to the ID of var, so it means that they are both names, both names pointing to the same space in memory. So the same thing happens with, uh, with TensorFlow. Okay, so uh, what happens if I go and just append bar into foe? It writes dot, dot, dot. So it means it, it's just given up, okay? Uh, it's so recursive that it doesn't have an end. TensorFlow also has a system to keep track of things somewhere and uh, giving uh, access via names. Next, we're going to start by the simplest uh, TensorFlow uh, neuron. We'll just have an input uh, weight, and we will be able to multiply that. We import TensorFlow, then we create the graph, and we define the values. Now we define the operation of the graph, and we grab it so we can look at the, the last operation we put in the graph, and we check, and yes, the operation there, the last operation is multiplication. Okay, so the next thing to do to generate an operation with which will initialize all of our variables and finally run it, 
Okay, and we get 0 0.8 something. So recall that this is 0 0.8 times 1 with 32-bit uh, uh, floats. 32 bits are, I have a hard time with 0 0.8. So 0 0.8000000001 is as close as they can get. Uh, this is the neurons inference or forward pass. Neat. Now, uh, the system takes the input uh, uh, 1 and returns 0, 0 0.8, which is, which is wrong, right? We need a way to measure how wrong the system is. So we'll call that measure the loss and give our system the goal of minimizing the loss. What to do is actually um, uh, run, and we get 1.6. Why, why is the value uh, of the gradient 1.6? Uh, OK, our loss is error squared, right? And the derivative of that is 2 times the error. So currently, the system says 0 0.8 instead of 0. So the error is 0 0.8, and 2 times 0 0.8, it's 1.6. Great, it's working. So let's apply this uh, gradient uh, 100 times and uh, finish the, the back propagation. The, the weight and the output value are now very, very, very close to zero. So it means that we actually made the neuron uh, learn. OK, good. So for the last step, uh, can see in, uh, in TensorFlow. So we run it. OK, so we'll see that we uh, have uh, come uh, down, 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 down until the error rate just uh, is enough for us to say it's pretty close to zero, and we have the result here. Um, Tesserboard has a lot of other stuff, uh, and here we can actually see uh, the last graph we created, so this one here. It's really nice to have actually see uh, the, to the graph that we code. So it's another way of, uh, of actually doing uh, machine learning. OK, sorry. That was really quick. I, I'm pretty sure you guys. <laughs> but you can consult the code. It, it's, it has a lot of comments. I just wanted you guys to see the code and that it works. It really works. It's not, it's not fake. <laughs> so in this case, let me continue here. In this case, uh, we have another long demo that I'm not going to show um, because there is no time. But I just wanted to show you something here about the GPU. So you can train, but this is on GitHub, and you can train your model using the GPU, and you can see there that it takes almost four times more time if you use the CPU. So this is like a huge, a huge gain. The other thing I want to, uh, and you can have Amazon GPU instances to do that. So it's, it's, really, it's really awesome, how the, the panorama that we have today. The other take that we can actually uh, do from those demos is that this, this uh, module of development can have actually a good uh, visualization with TensorBoard. So Google designed TensorBoard on top of of TensorFlow that's able to actually dig down what we are talking about in terms of uh, graphs. But we haven't seen yet the best of uh, machine learning and SRE. We're not gluing anything yet. We're just, well, we had the decision trees that checked if the, the, cell, the else of the server was OK or not. But that's not, that's not yet the thing. We, we want actually to use that to get anomaly detections and, fry, uh, and trigger automated response to that. We want to forecast server requests, and we can use LSTMs to do that in a few hours in advance. So what are uh, LSTMs? So very, very quickly, they are called long short-term memory networks, like your brain, right? You can keep the memory, but you cannot keep the memory in the machine for a long time. You need to keep that data for a long time so you are able to compare to the future time series and actually forecast, predict what's going to happen in the future. So this is particularly, particularly important in our next uh, 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 demo, which, which I'll go really, really quick here. Uh, can you use this? No problem. OK, I have this on GitHub. 
and just, where's my mouse? Let's see. Okay, so, so how do we use an LSTM to forecast time series? Very, very easy. We just import all of the things that we need in terms of NumPy, Keras, uh, TensorFlow. Then we actually uh, have a set of helper functions that you can use from the GitHub repo. All of these, they just plot and, and put the data inside. Then you actually are able to load the data inside. We can populate the test set and the training set and then use those. Then we build the module and compile it. So the, the way you saw that TensorFlow does this, just it first creates a graph and then it uses the graph afterwards. And then after this, we can check, well, this is exactly, this is a, like a text way of seeing exactly what you're seeing on, ten, on TensorBoard, which is more graphical, right? It's more, it's nicer. But here is uh, the text version. And then we can train the model. In this case, I've trained this model a hundred times. It could be in any, like in any other size, size of epochs. So you need to actually figure out how many times you need to train until the machine knows exactly what you want. So it's been trained. Let's go down. And we got results. So let me explain this. So we got 120 days. I forgot to mention that. So we got 120 days of site visits or server requests on the front end. And we feed the neural network with that. And then we ask the neural network, look, can you give me for another subset of data that's for the same site, can you give me what's going to happen in the next 20 hours? Look, the machine only knows what's going on behind this line here. And it was able actually to predict, to forecast in the next 20 hours what will happen to the site. Imagine we can, what we can do with this, right? It's incredible. Oh, and you can mention, uh, before I forget, you can, you can actually see that the first 10 hours are more accurate than the, the rest of the 10 hours, zero minutes, I know. But we have, the, we have the interval, so thank you. You can leave. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I know this guy. OK, so just to finish here, just to make the conclusions here. So what, what, what? I lost my notes. This is really. Bear with me. <sighs> okay. So, in the end, I wanted to do another demo about anomaly detection. We don't have time to do that, but the, the code is on the repo and it's able to actually detect from a random set of uh, uh, a cluster, can, say, can see what parts of that set are anomalies or not. You can check that on the repo. It's a work in progress. So DevOps, uh, DevOps culture. In conclusion, I believe that SRE and DevOps will continue to grow and benefit from machine learning in decision making and automation. Here's a few areas of enterprise IT that AI is, is and will be significantly, significantly impact in the future, like log analysis, capacity planning, infrastructure scaling, cost management, performance tuning, energy efficient, and especially on this last one, I don't know if you know this graph, this is recently Google, Google started managing his own data center cooling system through DeepMind. They managed to reduce the amount of energy used by 40%. So the drop that you see there is when they just switched on machine learning. There are further reading for the ones that want it. I, I would advise this book. It's deep learning uh, from, from uh, MIT. You can read it for free online 
on that link there. And yes, the time to apply machine learning is now. Thank you. That was really compressed. <laughs> So don't forget to evaluate this session. If you can do it now, do it, please. Uh, the, the, there also the link to the to GitHub repo is there. And if there are any questions, I, we have the interval now, so you can ask one or two questions. There's no problem. Questions? OK, thank you, guys. See you.